audio? Oh, okay, good. All right, we're good. Okay, uh, this message is called Conscience Not Thine Own. So last time uh, we looked at the inanimate object and how we tend to blame shift other people for our sin. And usually it's you blame shift to people, but we looked at you know even a more baser sort of blame shifting where you're blaming an object for evil and that it's responsible for your sin. So really, really ridiculous. Um, you know, good luck with that when you get to the great white throne of judgment. It wasn't me. It was the thing. You know, <laughs> come on. So that is crazy. Uh, this time it's it's almost like a two-parter, but this is going to be a little different. So I'll kind of expand on that a little bit. Uh, I, I want to go into the stuff isn't evil, but then kind of uh, grow on that and show uh, not only is the stuff isn't evil, the things, but we as mature believers have liberty. You know, we have liberty to touch, taste, handle these things. And then even a level beyond that, knowing we have liberty as mature saints, how can we use this liberty not to condemn others or to trip other people, but to edify and hopefully save others? So I kind of had this all laid out and you know, as you dig into this stuff, you find out, oh, that could be a message all unto itself. And, oh, you know, so you just keep going. So there's a lot, you know, a lot to cover. I'll try to keep it sort of organized here and we'll recap what we're talking about in the end. Okay, so first point, again, the stuff isn't evil. So we talked about that a little last time. Look at Romans 14.14. 14. I think this kind of sums it up in a sense. Romans 14, 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But see that there is nothing unclean of itself. So that thing isn't unclean of itself. How you esteem it is another matter. So we'll get into the, we're going to come back to this verse later on, but there's nothing unclean in and of itself, that, that object itself. Um, having said that, were there things that were unclean to Israel? Quite a few, right? Uh, one of the biggest ones was food. They couldn't eat certain unclean animals, right? So there's hundred, over a hundred verses with unclean in it, and a lot of it is food, but there was other things that were involved, dead bodies, dead animals, all kinds of stuff. So they had, they had a difference. There was a difference between Jew and Gentile. They had certain things they couldn't touch, taste, eat, and that difference went away. Um, look at Acts 10. 11 through 16 is where we start to see the transition from things being separate after Israel fell to it's kind of all the same. Acts 10, 11 through 16. So this is Peter. And saw, uh, and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to earth, where were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. So we see Israel fell, that distinction diminished. You know, there's no more unclean animal. There's no more Israel in their same state. It's all one in the age of grace. So, again, there's nothing unclean of itself, in and of itself. Um, and furthermore, how do we sanctify something today? Two things. 
two things we do to sanctify something today. Word and prayer. Look at, you get partial credit. First uh, <laughs> Timothy 4, 1 through 5. First Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Now the Spirit ex- speaketh ex- expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So those two things sanctify these things. Um, but every creature of God is good. Nothing to be refused. That's the age of grace we live in. There's no distinction. There's no unclean things. All things are lawful to us. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 10 through 13. First Corinthians six ten through thirteen. Is that what I want? First Corinthians six. Okay, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expe- but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful to for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and belly for the meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. I think I'm reading further than I wanted to read. And I am. Yeah. Uh, But look at verse 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for the meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. That's not the issue. The meats go in the belly and the belly is for the meats. But that's not the issue. All things are lawful unto me. But all things are not expedient. You know, again, a little foreshadowing of... Uh, how to use and how to how to use these things uh, in a in a grace manner as a mature saint. So all thi- but the point is the stuff isn't evil. Does that does that make sense? Is that clear? It's not the stuff. There's no unclean things today in the age of grace. Um, okay. So second part is we have liberty today in the age of grace. We are not under a bunch of ordinances and rules. Like I work in transportation. It's one of the most regulated industries out there. There's all kinds of rules about you know, how uh, you can only drive on certain roads. You have to drive within a certain number of hours. You have to take a certain break with the drivers. You know, There's all kinds of rules around DOT, hazmat, and all that stuff. And then I come into work, and there's rules. And I gotta be there at a certain time, I gotta dress a certain way, I gotta follow the company policy, and da, 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 da. it's like rules. All your life is rules. It drives me a little nuts. But I love my job. For any <laughs> for anyone uh, watching out there. Uh it's good. Pays the bills, can't complain. Um but there's a lot of rules. Now we we are not subject to these rules, these ordinances. Look at Colossians two, twenty through twenty three. Colossians 2, 20, 23. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinance? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which 
things have indeed a shoe of will of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So there's a lot packed into that verse. I love that verse. Um, but see, it's it's ordinary. He's talking about ordinances after the commandments and doctrines of men. We're not talking about the law. We're not talking about, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. These are ordinances, you know, that come from man, you know, mostly religious. You're not subject to that. Um, you're dead to that. Uh, another interesting, you know, and by the way, we, we looked at uh, touch last time. Look at verse 21. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Remember in the garden, couldn't, all of a sudden that was added. You couldn't touch it, you know, and that brought about a change in the, you know, in the message to Eve. So we don't have that, you know, that commandment. We could touch stuff. We can, you know, thankfully drink our coffee and do whatever we need to do. Mm. It's not bad. So we are subject to these ordinances. The other interesting thing in that verse, look at 23. Which things, now these things, obeying ordinances and rules, have indeed a shoe, a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the, bo- of the body. That will worship, that is, you're, you're worshiping your own will by doing these things. And I know a lot of, I have a lot of religious friends that will put their own will. That's really what you're doing when you're saying, I don't do this and I go to church every day. And, you know, whenever you, whenever you talk to somebody about the gospel, and they start reading you their resume. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they probably have a religious background. So they're trying to elevate up their will. They're trying to tell you what they've done. And that's really will worship. You know, I'm worshiping my own ability to adhere to these rules and laws and appearances and doctrines of men. So we're not subject to those rules. Uh, look at... Uh, Actually, skip back up a little higher. Wiggle that uh, battery, the power on there. It's probably just not. Okay, good. All right. Uh, Colossians 2, 16 through 18. So skip back a couple verses. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So you shouldn't be judged. Let no man judge you and meet or drink or in respect of any holy day, anything like that. So are we subject to that again from the religious outset? No. You know, we are not to be judged by that. And another interesting term in verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. Uh, why are, Don, why are you humble? Why don't why don't you think you're great? The gospel says I am unclean. I can do no thing. There is none righteous, no not one. Thank you. My heart is deceitfully wicked. Yep. So you fall short of the stand. You fall short of the righteous standard. We're humble because we know we fall short. And thank God we have the grace of God. We have that gift. Uh, as payment, we could be completely honest with ourselves. We know we're no good. Um, but others, the religious, says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. They're humble on a voluntary basis. They're, they're trying to come across as humble, but they're really not. You know, and you see it with these religious characters, you know, all the, the higher ups, you know, they come across, you know, it's very, very pious and no, oh, I'm humble. Yeah. But you know in their heart, boy, they're 
they think they're something. That's a voluntary humility, not not genuine. Okay, so I'm a little off track, but that's the point is we don't have those rules, we don't have those religious ordinances, we don't follow the commandments and doctrines of men. Uh, and look at, uh, but we have liberty. Look at Galatians 5.1. Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I just think it's an interesting verse. You know, when you think of religious activity, they want you to stand fast in your own strength and who you are and your ability to your will to get through and you know to do the right thing. This is saying stand fast in your liberty, in your freedom, because others are going to come in and try to take away your freedom and put you back under the law. So stand fast in that liberty that we have. Uh, and does that mean we do whatever we want? Galatians 5.13. 5.13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So we're not called the liberty to do whatever we want to do, or you know, should we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid. We're here to serve others, that's our reasonable service, it's called, right? Okay, so we know the things aren't evil, we're not under a bunch of rules and laws and ordinances in this day and age and the age of grace. Final piece is conscience, not thine own. And how do you, how do you know, knowing these things, you know, live for others on a, on a higher level, at a mature level um, as a believer? So we're going to look at Romans 14, but we, uh, when I was working... I started out, my, I think I've told you my dad was a painter. I grew up painting and started out really young working with him. And then for a while there, he didn't have work. So he had a friend, friend of, a, of a, his brother-in-law, Steve Bruni, who had some work and he worked on new houses. So I worked with Steve one summer and ended up, you know, Steve was with Chuck. So I had, I had stood no chance, you know. <laughs> a little 16-year-old kid walking in with two pastors, you know, just, bah, 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 Bible, Bible, you know. So it was, but glory to God, it was great. And we had, uh, you know, so I got saved pretty young and, you know, we learned a lot and, and you know, ended up starting going to the church. But there was one guy that started with us, Randy, what was his last name? Randy? I can't think of it. So he was a guy, that, you know, kind of rough character and he came in and he might have gotten saved, we're not really sure, but we'd, you know, pick on each other or make fun of each other. And whatever we did with Randy, <clears throat> the one thing he knew was Romans 14. You know, so whenever we picked on him, he'd go, Romans 14! Because that's the mature brother, you know, relating to the immature brother. So he would always cry Romans 14. Uh, and we'd tell him to <laughs> shut up and get back to work. So... <laughs> Uh, Romans 14, 1 through 6. Romans 14, 1 through 6. Okay. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord doth he not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So, look at uh, look again at Roman or verse two. For one believer that he may eat all things; another who is weak eateth herbs. So there you see a weak. It 
it says, you know, the weaker brother is the one that's thinking, I can only do certain things. So they're the ones thinking, oh, these things are unclean, I can only do this. have that today. You have people that, you know, whether they're religious or not, don't eat certain things, don't touch certain things, you know, all the time. So it doesn't make them bad, but we have the opportunity to help them and not flaunt our liberty to them as they do it. Um, and it's not just food, it's holidays too, you know, holy days. I mean, we have uh, our family, I only have a few people here and left in our family, but we get together with them on Christmas. So I'm, you know, and we don't do gifts and I don't dress up as Santa, but we get together. So I'm thankful that we have a holiday that we can get together. I don't esteem it any better than any other day. They do, but that's in their heart. And yeah, I'm just thankful to get together and gather. Um, okay, so moving on, Romans, this is gonna be a long read, Romans 14, 13 through 23. So look at 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth God is acceptable to God and proved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things which where, wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroyeth not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, um, it's interesting. Look at... Uh, uh, where'd it go? Look at verse 14 again. I know and am persuaded. Again, going back to that nothing unclean of itself. Um, look at, uh, let's see, verse 20. For meat destroyed, not the work of God. All things indeed are pure. So all things, again, are pure for us, but the issue is the other person, the other man's conscious. You know, what's going to cause them to stumble? What's going to cause them to fall? That's what we should be thinking of. Is It's not our, our own liberty. We know we have liberty to touch, eat, taste these certain things. Um, so verse 21, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything. I'm just saying anything. I don't care what it is. Um, whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So we have to discern the situation, right? We have to know, you know, where is that person at? Are they saved? Are they unsaved? Could be saved and have a religious background and still think there's things they can't touch, taste, and handle. So you've got to be able to discern that and use your liberty to respond to the, each situation. Edification is the key. Uh, all right, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 13. 1 Corinthians 8. All right, I've got to find shorter passages. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 13. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols... We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is none other God but one. For though there be that there are called gods, which are in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom all are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom 
are all things and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. That doesn't make you any better or worse to God, whether you choose not or choose to. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through my knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ." Wherefore, if my meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So, pretty, it doesn't need a whole lot of interpretation there. I mean, it's if, if that meat is going to offend your brother, don't do it. Choose not to. If it's some meat that's offered up unto idols and there's some ceremony around that and some brother would be weakened by that, don't participate in it. Or, you know, if some brother thinks that's okay to eat, then go for it. Go ahead. Don't push it away just because. So respond to their conscience in that. Um, and also like the, uh, look at uh, look at verse 4 again. Again, there's, there's just offshoots of messages all over the place. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols... We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. An idol is nothing. They can't taste, taste, touch, breathe. It's nothing. There's one God. You know That idol, whatever they're putting up there in their table and they're eating to, that's nothing to us. right? We don't touch it, juggle it, you know, light it on fire. Who cares? That is not a God. Uh, okay. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 33. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 33. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man, every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that shoot it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This is my key verse. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So it's not your conscience that's at stake here. You know you can eat anything. You know the idol is nothing. What about the other guy's conscience? It's not thine own. It's another man's. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Where, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God, giving none offense neither to the Jews nor the Gentiles nor the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So that's the key. The ultimate goal is that people can get saved, right? I mean, that's why we do these. That's why we choose to use our liberty in a way that we're not putting ourselves under the law. We're not putting someone else under the law. We understand. We're trying to figure out where their conscience is. May have a problem touching this or tasting that. Well, be conscious of that. Ultimately, for the goal is that they might get saved. So, conscience, not thine own. 
Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 9. We're getting close to wrapping it up here. Last verses. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 22. First Corinthians nine nineteen, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I may that I might gain the more, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without the law as without the law, being not without law to God but under the law to Christ that I may gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So that's the, so the, the conclusion there. Is that talking about saved or unsaved people? Is it saved? It's, well, not totally sure, but the, the last part of the verse, that I might by all means save some. So the point of doing all this is for the unsaved that we might save some. So that's what we saw in the other verse as well. Um, so we, we adapt to that situation. I struggle with this verse. If you look at that again, look at 21. kind of struggle with this. Like, What does that really mean? To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without a law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I may gain them that are without the law. And then he talked about in verse 20, um, to them that are under the law, as under the law. So he's, you know, he's talking about unsaved people, but Paul's adapting to someone that's, quote, under the law and not under the law. And I, you know, kind of scratch my head around that one for a while. Um, two stories, though, to close that I think this kind of brought it to light. Um, one was Chuck's told it many, many times. And I think he was a young pastor and just got saved and not too long. And he was, you know, talking to everybody. And, you know, whenever you talk to your family, you're always more aggressive, it seems like, because you want them to get saved so you're going right at them don't you get this and you know you got to be real careful not to invade their free will um but you know when he's younger he went to um i think it was his brother-in-law's house and they were you know sitting down and they were apparently had some religious background i guess and so he you know they knew he, he just got saved and was talking about things and they were having dinner and he said, you know what? So he knew, he understood these verses about liberty. He knew what he can touch, taste, handle. I'm free, right? I'm free. There's no law. I'm not under the law. So he had a beer at dinner. You know, just a beer. Didn't get smashed or hammered. Just had a beer. Well, that didn't go over so well with the religious. So it, co I guess, caused a little hubbub. And, you know, they weren't too happy with him. And how dare, how could a pastor have a beer? You know, blah, blah. So, I mean, he admitted, like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, you know. Was he, could he have done it? Sure. But knowing the environment you're in and their, their, um, perception of you, or at least their perception of someone that's a Bible believer, Christian, whatever you want to call it, whatever their perception is, that's the conscience that you're adapting to, not your own. So again, he's younger, you know, you learn things. He was trying to make a point that I can do, hey, I can do this, but, that, you know, that wasn't the right approach. I had a, a better experience. I, I blocked out all my bad stories, so I can only tell a good one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm still here, though. Yeah. Geez, shh, shh. Uh, so I, I kind, of, uh, kind of the exact opposite of that to someone that's not under the law. So I mentioned I got saved younger and, you know, working with Chuck and Steve and so it was like all day Bible. I mean, I went from nothing to, you know, like the full, I got the full degree, the full Monty uh, in those first four or five years, working with them every day. So eventually I went off to go to college. And so I went junior college. And by the time I got to Northern, where I went away, I was already 21. So I can already drink, you know, you can already do all that stuff. So I think I told you guys, you know, I grew up 
dad was an alcoholic, you know, really bad, and, you know, just had enough of that. I saw the damage that could cause and said, mm, I don't want anything to do with that. And it's just not my thing. You know, I get a lot of besetting sins and different things that I get caught up in, but there's one, for whatever reason, like that wasn't one of them. To this day, I don't understand why you would intentionally, you know, drink and get hammered and wake up and make yourself sick the next day. Like, I don't get that. Like, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So anyway, um, so I go up to college and I'm thinking, okay, there's a couple different ways I could play this. I mean, I want to, you know, I've been hearing this all the time. I want to talk. I could go up there and go, I'm not drinking, you know, and just make a stand and just stand out and say, look at me. And, you know, everybody talks about it and who's the Christian guy and all that. But I could do that. But I know what will happen there is they'll look at me like you think you're better than us. You know, and the emphasis will be on, ooh, the alcohol. Like, what's wrong with a little alcohol? All these other guys have been waiting their whole life to drink, and, you know, most of the people were around that age anyway. So I thought, you know what? No, I think I'm going to do it the other way. I'm going to actually have a beer on occasion, you know, and be, blend in and use my liberty as they use their liberty to say, there's nothing wrong with this thing. You know, it's okay. You can have one. Now, I tried to not overdo it and get super hammered and was successful 83% of the time, but, you know, it's, you try. Um, but that it, it allowed me to talk to a lot more people on the same level, and they still know something's different. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't long before you start talking about the Bible and they go, oh my God, you know, what are you? You're an alien. But, you know, you dress normal, you have a beer, and they're like, something's different, though. You know, you're not the typical get in your face and, you know, show you, you know, show people what you're all about and all that stuff. So anyway, that, I think there's different ways, you know, to somebody that's under the law, to somebody that's a religious person, you may want to play it straight up. And you may want to, you know, follow along with their line of thinking and adapt to their conscience. To somebody that, you know, has liberty and they could touch and taste something, you may want to, you know, to an extent, I mean, there's always, you don't want to go overboard, you don't want to get caught up in something, but, you know, you can engage in your liberty. And the ultimate goal is, um, at 1 Corinthians 9.22, that by all means, I might save some. So that's the point. So we're, just to recap, you know, the stuff isn't evil. You know, we could touch, taste, handle. We have liberty. We're not under the law. But a better way to do it is to use our liberty to adapt to other people's conscience and use our maturity that we may save some. So, okay. Uh, Father, we're just so thankful for your word. We're thankful that we have an understanding of, uh, you know, are the times that we live in and what's allowed under liberty and that we have this not only salvation but uh, instruction on how to live today and interact with others and maturity, and we pray that um, you know we can use it to uh, to save some, and uh, we'll keep Laura in our prayers too as she's off on her own. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, thanks. Thank I was I was, a, I was trying to cover a lot of ground. And,